Крыша, я первый вас понял. 808, 50, 84, 8, 550. Vector 360, flight level 230, call a pre -brief. Scramble, scramble, scramble. Hello again everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video we are back taking another look at the Just Flight Avro Vulcan. Very rarely these days once I've previewed or reviewed an aircraft do I have enough free time to take another look at the product. I really wanted to in the case of the Vulcan though which hopefully goes to demonstrate just how much I'm loving the aircraft. This flight certainly won't just be a repeat of what we looked at last time when we covered the Vulcan. And indeed, the aim of today's video is really just to cover off any of the items that we didn't get to see during our previous outing. By far and away, the question that I received the most during my previous Vulcan flight was where on earth is the iconic howl from the aircraft? For those that were wondering, the previous version of the aircraft we looked at was actually fitted with the Olympus 301 engines, which according to Just Flight don't actually produce any noticeable howl during the takeoff. We ran that version during the preview as it was the only sound set available to us at the time. But we now have the 201 engines fitted to the aircraft with the associated and fully complete sound set. So for our flight today we're going to be taking a look at the rear section of the cockpit. We'll take a look at the AEO station. We'll cover off a few more points as well regarding the tablet, the onboard munitions. We're going to carry out an abbreviated startup and we'll run the first start externally so that you can hear the full range of sounds available and recorded by Just Flight. We'll run those Olympus 201s all the way through to take off power. We'll sit on the runway for just a few seconds so that you can hear that wonderful and iconic howl, which I have to say has been captured and remastered beautifully by Just Flight. Today, we're going to be taking the aircraft around the Mac loop. Of course, that needed to be done just for a quick flight, again, to demonstrate the flight model, talk through a few more points regarding the product. We'll then be making our return to Valley. And then as usual, at the end of the video, we'll carry out a bit of a debrief and I'll let you know what I think about the add-on. Although I think at this point that's probably already pretty clear. So hopefully you'll still find today's video interesting. It should build upon what we saw previously. If you haven't seen my previous breakdown of the Just Flight Avro Vulcan, I'll leave a link to that video up above. As always, I do hope you enjoy the flight. If you do, please consider giving the video a like and subscribing to the channel. Okay, so we're going to be starting our flight today then from the rear section of the cockpits. We're currently seated at the AEO station. Unfortunately, the entirety of the rear section is not modelled, as you can see. That would have been really nice to have, of course, just to help bring every aspect of the Vulcan back to life. And what would be a really nice option, I don't know whether or not it's available to just flight, but perhaps if we could get a small paid update in the future, just have the rear cockpit section modelled here as well, that would be really great. Either way though, the AEO station itself modelled very well. Again, excellent texturing and detailing. And as you expect, full systems depth here as well. So running through the checks, we're currently on board a fully cold and dark aircraft. We'll take the battery master on. Throw a little bit of light onto the situation. The battery voltage is checked, currently showing 25 volts. For the non-essential supplies, we can trip those. Checking both the magnetic indicators. And we'll reset those back onto the bus. Ordinarily at this point, we connect up the ground power unit to the aircraft. But today, again, slightly out of sequence, we're going to be firing up the AAPP or the Auxiliary Airborne Power Plant. Essentially an APU, we're just going to use that to supply the aircraft electrically. That'll allow us to see a little bit more functionality here on the panel, and also hear the sounds here as the AAPP fires up. So for the checklist there, the LP fuel cock will select through to open, carry out a fire test. The oxygen relight switch is often guarded. The AAPP master switch is selected on. We'll hit the starter. And you can see there the oil pressure coming up, EGT coming up there as well. So we'll just wait there on the unit to stabilise. Again, really nice sounds on the aircraft. And stabilise there around 700 degrees. So the AAPP is now available, we'll take that onto the bus. And you can see that's giving us around 115 volts, 400 cycles, which is what we're expecting to see. We'll leave the aircraft electrical configuration as is for now. 
In the meantime, we've got the tablet here as well, located at the AEO station. You can select the tablet from any station on board the aircraft. We'll just take the opportunity here, though, whilst we're down the back, to take a look at the tablet and some of the features available to us. So if we come back to the home page, very typical of any Just Flight tablet from any Just Flight product that you may have flown. Firstly, for the OFP, we can actually import a Simbrief flight plan, which is actually a really nice feature to have. Of course, potentially you're going to be doing some long-range flights with the Vulcan, and Simbrief is good as anything else for planning those flights. Next, we have the map. Again, very much as you'd expect, just using OpenStreetMap data by the looks of things. And again, we're currently located at RAF Valley, just on the island of Anglesey. For the charts, I haven't linked up my Navigraph chart account, but the aircraft does have Navigraph chart capabilities. So again, really nice touch there. Aircraft is where most of the options are available. Firstly, we'll click on the Settings tab. You can see whether or not we want the altimeters to sync up between both the pilot and the co-pilot. We also have state saving, which is a really nice option. You don't see that on too many military aircraft. GPS navigation, I believe, if you set up a flight plan via the Sims inbuilt flight planning tool, you can have the aircraft follow that using the appropriate autopilot modes. Cockpit pilots, you'll see later on, we do have really nice custom pilot models available on the Vulcan. For realistic steering, that pertains to the nose wheel steering. Essentially there with that mode selected on, you'll have to hold down the nose wheel steering button each time you want to make a turn. Otherwise though, you can just use rudder pedals as you might usually do so. The auto shoot jettison option does exactly as you might expect. I believe that has to shoot auto jettison at 60 knots after deployment. And trim sensitivity, again a really nice option to have. The Vulcan by default is quite a trim sensitive aircraft so you might want to dial that in a little bit further. As far as the aircraft configuration options go, numerous configuration options here, which again is really great to see. We can convert the aircraft to a K2 tanker. We've got the 201 engine option, which a big part of the flight here today is to demonstrate that. You will get the iconic howl that I know so many of you want here with the aircraft. We have the nose probe for air-to-air -air refueling. We also have a TFR, dome, ECM options. The MRR, which I believe is maritime, radar and reconnaissance. We also have options for the 558 aerials and also auto throttle, which is nice. I don't believe that was included with previous versions of the product. You can also very easily set up the aircraft fuel state. You can choose presets here between 25 and 100%. You can also adjust things with a little bit more finesse, setting a total fuel percentage. The weights are indicated in pounds, and it would perhaps be nice to have an option to display those in kilograms as well, but of course, no big deal. Lastly, we have a radio page available from the tablet. We can select TACAN channels, set the transponder, as well as the common nav radios. Same there for the ADF. You can see as well we have state tabs, so we can choose ready for takeoff, ready for start, and cold and dark. My experience with using those, the aircraft will be fully configured, but you'll still have to use Control e to actually get the engine started. We do also have visibly modelled weapons on board the aircraft, which is again a really nice touch. We have the Blue Steel Standoff Nuclear Missile, Mark 13 Bombs, the Whiskey Echo 177 Nuclear Bomb, the Maritime Radar and Reconnaissance Pods. We also have saddle fuel tanks as well as cylinder fuel tanks located in the bomb bay of the aircraft. And finally as well we have the Shrike Anti-Radiation Missile. Further to that we also have the ground GPU as well as the external air carts. We do have a few nice external features as well. We have the ability to fit chocks and covers. We can also open and close the bomb bay and the crew door by the tablet. As well we can extend the K2 hose, although that's not an option available when the aircraft's on the ground. Back to the main page again then, we have a notes page, pretty simple there, you can just use the page to draw out any notes should you wish for example to use the aircraft on VATSIM. We have all of the aircraft checklists available from the tablet as well, really nice to see. We also have those with the in-sim checklist feature, as well as available from the manual. The top of descent calculator does exactly as you might suggest, you can put in your current flight parameters and the tablet will work out a top of descent point for you. And lastly, in terms of settings, fairly basic there, we have the option to choose between a 12 and 24 hour clock format. You can also set local or Zulu time. And you can choose whether or not you display your OFP user login name. There are various themes as well available on the tablet and lastly, you can adjust the brightness up and down. So again, very nice functionality from the tablet there overall. Namely, you've got the Simbrief integration, the Navigraph chart integration, 
and plenty of options, fixtures and fittings to configure the Vulcan for your chosen flight. Anyway, that's about it in terms of our work down the back here today. We're going to spend the rest of our flight up the front. We've already run through a full con dark start with my previous demonstration of the Vulcan. So to save a little bit of time here in the video today, we're going to head back up to the flight deck and we'll already have run through most of the pre-flight checks and we'll be ready for the engine start. Okay, so we now have ourselves strapped into the left-hand seat of the mighty Vulcan. As you can see, it's a fairly grey and gloomy day here on the Granite Valley. It's probably going to be much the same over towards the Mac Loop. So with that in mind, we definitely don't need the visors. We can get rid of those. And um, we also have models very nicely, what I presume are anti-flash windows. And same again, we'll get rid of the visor. So again, the aircraft is pretty much configured here, ready for the start. We'll just run through a few pre-start checks. The low-pressure fuel cocks are selected open and guarded. HP fuel cocks are set through to shut. The throttle detent isolation switch is set in. Pressure selector is set through to cruise and guarded. Cabin air switches are selected off. The ram air valve is shut. Temperature selector is set. The cold air turbine magnetic indicator is out. External lights master switch is selected on. We've got the nav lights set through to flash. Tank pressurization is selected off and we have four white magnetic indicators. Air to air refueling panel is selected off. Fuel pumps are set through to on. And the engine and airframe anti-icing is selected off. For the start itself, it's going to be a normal start once again. This time though, we're going to head outside for the number one engine start so that you can hear the start sequence in its entirety. So for the normal start checklist, the air selector is set through to normal, ignition switch is selected on, and the engine master switch is selected on. The air crossfeed magnetic indicator indicating open. We're starting off the external ground air, so the throttles are closed, and indications look good. Again, we're going to be starting the number one first, so we'll take the engine air number one switch on. And we'll hit the number one starter. Okay, so we have three good starts, just the number four left to go. We'll hit the number four starter. And just monitoring the engine here as it runs up, we do have rotation. All pressure coming up there as well. And just coming up through 15% there on the RPM. We'll introduce the fuel, the HP fuel cock will set through to open. You have a good light off. We're looking for a max of 700 degrees there on the EGT during the start. And it looks as though the number four is stable there as well. So we do have four good starts running through the after start checks. The alternators are all set on. Again, that's down to the AO station. The amber lights are out and the alternator failure light is extinguished. Engine master switch is selected off. Same there as well, we'll take the ignition switch off and the air crossfeed magnetic indicator is showing shut. The fuel console that is configured for the departure, engine air switches are all selected off, cabin air switches are both shut. Carry on air brake test, so first through to the medium drag position and again indicating that the air brakes have extended through to high drag. And we'll stay those once again, the magnetic indicator is out. Hydraulic pressure is checked up in the green, the Bombay door operation. We'll set that through to open. You can see we're in transit and indicating open. And we'll close that up once again. And the door indicating closed. So back through to auto for the PFC auto stabilizers and feel. We'll take all of those on. And we'll come on to system one for the ore damper. 
you can see all of our flight controls aggressively coming online. Really nice as well the way that's been modelled. It used to happen instantaneously with previous versions of the aircraft in P3D and X-Plane. Those check lights are out. The fuel lock switch is set through to normal. The green light is off. Really nice to see that Just Fly have updated that as well. It was amber in the previous video. Main warning lights are checked and out. The flight controls. We have full up. Pull down. And neutral. Pull left. Pull right. And neutral. And on the rudder. Pull left. Pull right. And neutral. The 28 volt TRU is again taken care of by the AEO. The AAPP, we've obviously already got that started up. External power has been removed, the alternators have been synchronised. The AVS master switch, again really buried away down the back, that is set through to open. That's it in terms of the after start checks for the taxi checks, the ejection seat safety pins have been removed, pressure head heaters are selected on. We'll close up the entrance door in just a moment's time, we'll have the ground crew remove the chocks. We'll take the taxi lights and we'll make our way up towards runway 31. Now leader 5 at Atlantic approaching Foxtrot North. Can leader 5 cross Foxtrot North north to south after departing? Leader 5 after the departing twin cross north to south report vacated. Leader 5, thank you. India 0108, line up and wait on runway 27. Okay, so we now have ourselves lined up on runway 31. Running through the before takeoff checks, the electrics are set. Again, that's the job of the AO. The PFC and stabilized panel, that is checked, lights are out. Main warning lights are out, magnetic indicators are checked. The hydraulic pressures are checked up in the green. Fuel console is set. We'll just take track on here as well for the autopilot. That way it's pre-selected ahead of time. The DI switch is set through to medium, tank pressurization switch. Tricky to see here with our co-pilot down on the right, but that is set. Our temperatures, we have a QNH of 1019 set on both sides, showing an aerodrome elevation of around 40 feet. The run out is selected on, and currently showing zero. Cabin air switches, again a little bit tricky to see, we've currently got the port cabin air switch selected open. And same for the engine air switches, we've got one and two. Both selected to the open position. For the takeoff in the Vulcan, as we looked at last time, nominally you'd come through to 80% on the RPMs. Let the engine stabilise, release the brakes, and off we go. Today, though, we're going to come up to just above 90%, as that's really the RPM range in which the Vulcan tends to howl the most. And I know that many of you are very keen to hear that iconic howl. So, brakes off, holding the aircraft just on the tow brakes. Uh, coming up on the throttles. As I say, we'll let the engine RPM stabilise around 90-95% for just a few seconds. That will give us a great opportunity to hear that howl once we go to the external shot for the takeoff. Okay, so RPMs look good. Forward on the stick, lots of forward pressure needed during the takeoff with the Vulcan. And power set as we start barreling down the runway. The aircraft pretty quick to accelerate as well, already just come up through 100 knots. Targeting rotation at 150, there's 150. So just easing back on that forward pressure. The nose wheel gradually coming up. We do have positive climb, we'll take the gear up. And ordinarily we'd pitch for two five zero knots, but we're going to keep ourselves low level here just to maintain visual with the ground. So we'll gently pitch the nose down and allow the aircraft to build some speed.
Okay, so just coming through 250 knots, 1,000 foot there on the right out. We've got Hollyhead off the nose. We're going to level off here around 1,000 foot. And we'll start going back as well now on the power. We'll set ourselves up for a 300 knot cruise. So back to around 80% on the RPMs. Okay, power's set for the off takeoff checklist. The undercarriage is up, lights are out for the takeoff. Cruise selector will come through to cruise. And just approaching Hollyhead for the landing lamps, we'll leave those on as we're staying low level. Same for the tank pressurization, the cabin air, and the engine air, we'll leave all of those as they currently are. So starting a left turn here back out towards the southeast. We'll maintain around a thousand foot here above the water. Anti-icing separate as required and Bombay tanks once again not fitted to the aircraft here today so we've got the fuel tank selectors set through to the main. And we'll just crank on a little bit of G here through the turn. So just coming around the corner. Put ourselves onto a reciprocal heading more or less. Runway 31. So you can see the mainland there off the nose. And we'll just be coming up on the coastline of Anglesey once again fairly shortly. As I mentioned though during my previous flight, the Vulcan an absolute joy to hand fly. Feels really nice in the sim. A very unique feeling flight model as well. We discussed that, of course, during my previous outing in the aircraft. None of that oversensitivity that you often see in Microsoft Flight Simulator, so it's really nice to see that just fly have managed to pull that one off. The aircraft can be a little bit fussy in trim, namely in pitch. You do need to make a lot of trim input to keep the aircraft straight and level. We'll try and get ourselves trimmed out here so that we can go hands-free just to demonstrate that. So pretty nicely and trimmed now, hands off the controls, and you can see the aircraft will maintain straight level, but you certainly need quite a bit of input ahead of time. As discussed though, you do have the ability to adjust the trim sensitivity from the tablet. So that certainly helps quite a bit in terms of trimming the aircraft. 80% though, working very nicely for a 300 knot cruise. We're showing 1400 foot on the altimeter. And about the same there on the rad out. You'd expect that of course, we're currently over the water. We'll have Valley just coming up off the left wing. So again, tracking the reciprocal currently down runway 31. We'll be making a return later on after we've done our run around the back loop. We might come back for a visual onto runway 31. We'll see whether or not the weather's closed in, otherwise it'll be a an ILS onto runway 13. So just continuing to track down the coast. Still over Anglesey at the moment, we'll be crossing over the Menai Strait in a minute or so's time. We've got Carnarvon off the nose, you probably can just about make that out. So we'll have Bangor further out towards the north. It is worth noting the visibility in the Vulcan, not particularly stellar, so if you're looking at that as an aspect to buying the product, it may not be the aircraft for you, but it's one of the product's very few weaknesses overall. And of course, no fault of just flight, that's just the way the aircraft was designed. So as I say, we'll continue to track down the coast here, low level, to maintain visual. We'll hit the mainland in just a moment's time. We'll head outside for now, and I'll come back to you again as we approach the Mac Loop. Okay, so we are just approaching the entrance to the Mac Loop. We're going to be coming in via Machenthleth. I will have to say, actually, once I got the Vulcan trimmed out, the aircraft did sit pretty stably during the cruise. Didn't need much input from me. So I'm not sure whether or not just flight have done a little bit more tweaking to the flight model since the preview version of the aircraft we looked at, or maybe my piloting of the aircraft just improved a little bit. 
Anyway, just coming around the corner, coming overhead the town of Avadavi, currently following the river inbound towards Machencleth. We'll be starting the run from there. As I discussed during our previous outing of the aircraft, the Vulcan really doesn't like to be high speed, so despite the name of the Mac loop, we'll take some speed down the initial first stretch, but we'll have to slow the aircraft up later on for our run as we pick up the turn through Malchwid and up through Chorus. Anyway, we've got the river off the nose, so we can follow that. Machenfleth just a little bit further down the range. You can already see the start of the run. And in terms of our fuel on board the aircraft, we've got about 3,000 pounds there in both the number two and three feed tanks. About 2,000 pounds in number one and four. It's about 10,000 pounds of fuel on board the aircraft. That's plenty to get us around the map loop and back towards valley. So Machenfleth just coming up at our one o'clock. I'm sure many of you probably aren't all that familiar with the channel from a couple of years ago, but I used to do plenty of runs around the map loop, unfortunately these days it was never all that popular as a subject matter, so I don't tend to do it so much. Certainly though, I really enjoy making the run. Hopefully I can remember all of the features as we go, I'll point them out. So the start of the run here is Machenfleth. We'll be coming over the road to be in the town shortly. We can continue to follow the river for now. We'll just keep 80% on the RPMs. So there's no point picking up any extra speed here, really, as again, we're going to have to kill that off as we come left around the corner later on. But we'll bring ourselves down towards low level. That's always the best way to fly the back loop, of course. So, tracking down the valley for now, following the A470, we'll be following that for quite a chunk of the run. And again, we've got the river down there on our left. There's a train line as well that parallels that. So, around 310 knots currently, still some level of control authority out of the Vulcan. You can see though, the aircraft is pretty lazy, pretty docile. Even if I go full deflection there out to the left, the roll rate, very slow. But again, I like that, I like the fact that the flight model feels unique feels appropriate for the aircraft. So just approaching Kimais, we've got the wind farm there up on the brow of the hill. You can start the left turn now, continuing to follow the A470 out towards Mashwid. Quite surprisingly actually the Welsh name seemed to be more or less still rolling off the tongue. I thought I would have completely forgotten how to pronounce any of those. I'm sure I'm still not hitting them spot on, but I think for a an Englishman, not a bad effort, hopefully. So again, just continuing to follow the A470 as we track down the valley. And as we make the turn here, we can point the aircraft in towards the hill. We'll make a turn through Dinas Malthui in just a moment's time. We'll probably have to take a little bit of speed break in order to do that. We'll see how we go. There's the A470 down on the right-hand side of the aircraft. So again, there's our hill. And just approaching our turn, we'll get the aircraft banked in early. Just trying to avoid here bleeding off any excess speed. We'll obviously bleed off some speed here as we come through the turn. And I'm really not looking to pull anything more than 2G here throughout the run. Okay, so no real problems with the turn here as we come over Dinas Malfoy. The aircraft does still have enough control authority to get us through the turn. Uh, we're doing about 280 knots now, so I'd expect a little bit more control authority, which is what we're getting. So again, we'll just continue to follow the course of the valley out towards Bush. And um, we are going to have to reverse the turn here. I think the Vulcan will just about manage that as well. Definitely now that the speed's fallen back, we've got much more roll rates. So we'll come over the brow of the hill here through Bush. Uh, next point we're going to be picking up is the cross foxes in. We've got the road again down below us. And as we descend here, as that speed picks up again, just struggling a little bit more to get the roll rate out of the aircraft that we require there to make the turn. So still tracking the A470, but we'll be picking up the A487 in just a moment's time. We'll start the turn early here, otherwise we're never going to make the turn radius. There's the cross foxes in. And again, up to around 2G as we come around the corner. We'll overbank slightly here just to get ourselves back down towards the ground. There's the A487 down below us. 
That's going to take us in towards Schlimming Gill. And ultimately on towards Chorus and Chorus Corner. This is great fun though. Not as speedy as some of the runs I made on the loop, but nevertheless, a really special experience in the sim, I think for any Brit or anyone that loves the Vulcan. So it's Lindman Gill. Again, really struggling here to get the aircraft around the turn. We'll take the speed break. Just to give us that little bit more roll rate. Just about getting away with that one. And now coming hard back on the stick. We get up to around 2G. Almost full deflection there to get the aircraft around the turn. So you really got to be able to game with the Vulcan. You've got to think three things ahead of time. Otherwise you will get caught out in these sorts of manoeuvres. As you saw there as I came around the turn between the valley, just about clearing the hills. Down through Chorus Corner then, approaching the town of Chorus. Going to take that speed break again, bleed off some of that speed. We'll come back to around 250 knots, just to help us get through the last and twistiest section of the run. There's 250, stowing the speed break again. And now we'll just make a straight run for the exit. Building up again back towards 300 knots as we go. Two more wind turbines off the left of the aircraft. I really like that custom visual model of the pilot there from Just Flight. We mentioned that again in the last fight as well, but I think that's a really nice touch. And it really goes to show just how much effort Just Flight put into the aircraft. They could just as easily use the default Sobo pilot model, which would have worked, but it wouldn't have worked quite as nicely. So here's McIntleth again off the nose. And just coming over the road. So it completes the run. Overall, we got pretty lucky there with the weather. Fairly nice conditions throughout. Don't know whether or not the same is going to be true as we head back towards Valley. I think the weather was closing in over there. Either way, we'll track our way back home along the coastline, retracing our steps. And one way or another, as I say, it's going to either be the visual onto runway 31 or the RLS onto runway 13. I'll come back to you again once we've made our decision and we're in the approach bound for Valley. Okay, so we're on final approach at the moment for runway 13 at RAF Valley. As you can see, the weather has definitely taken a turn for the worse. Currently tracking the loke and the glide slope, just coming through 200 knots, we'll slow back towards 180. And we'll just go with medium drag for now on the speed brake here as well. Again, that's just going to allow us to keep the aircraft a little bit more speed stable, keep some high thrust here as we come down the approach. The descent checklist, the altimeters are set. Just coming through 2,500 feet there on both sides. Takeoff crew selector will go back through to takeoff. Engine air switches, take those off ahead of time. Although it's not as per the checklist yet. Cabin air switches, just need to close both of those up as well. Alternators are set, the AAPP has already been started. Nav selector is set through to ILS. Just coming down through 2,000 feet, we'll take the gear down. The four landing checks, we're swinging on three greens. Just coming visual with the runway lighting now at Valley. Let the speed reduce back towards 160 knots. And looks like we are clear of the rain as well now, so we'll take the wipers off. Okay, we do have three greens there on the gear, speed is reducing. Look for the four landing checklist, the undercarriage is down, three greens, brakes are checked, hydraulics look good. For the fuel. Fuel pumps are set, we've got a thousand pounds there on number one and four, about fifteen hundred there on number two and three. So sufficient fuel, we do need to make a go around, but we are now visual. Hang lamps are set, engine air switches are shut, that is the before landing check is complete. And we are now very nicely visual with the runway, so we'll take the autopilot out. Get that speed back towards 160, a little bit low there actually on the Pappy. Despite being on the glide, I'm not going to put that down to the aircraft, it never seems to match up very well in the sim. We'll fly the Pappy though now that we're visual. So back towards 160. We want to be 140 as we come over the threshold. And touching down, we'll take the drag chute at 135. 
Just putting in a little bit more trim, coming down through a thousand foot on the right outs. Decision height's 300 feet. Still one white there on the Pappy. They're just reducing that descent rate. Speed rolling back towards 150. Okay, nicely on the Pappy now. Even the Pappy there looks as though it's putting us just a touch high. Going to maintain one white on the Pappy for now. I think that's going to do us a little bit more favours for hitting the touchdown zone. So we'll go full speed brake. Let's bring the speed back towards 140. And trimming for that. Just approaching the threshold, so off the power. Already 3, 135. You can actually get the aircraft pretty slow here at a touchdown. Take the drag chute. Down through 100 knots, we'll just let the drag chute do its work for now. Lowering the nose wheel onto the runway, again actually needing a little bit of forward pressure there on the stick. Nose wheel's down. Again, we've got the automatic jettison selected, so the drag chute should drop momentarily. And we'll vacate down off the left, so onto the brakes. We'll roll through towards the departure end. So there you go guys, I do hope you enjoyed our outing in the Just Flight Avro Vulcan. Once again, this is an add-on that I absolutely love. I think Just Flight have completely knocked the ball out of the park with the Vulcan. We did round the product up a little bit briefly during my preview, but we'll go into a little bit more depth here during the conclusions of this full review. That being said, most of what I have to say is of course positive. There are very few negatives that I can really level at the aircraft. Firstly, as far as the texturing and the modelling goes, pretty spot on overall. The external modelling is superb, the same goes internally within the cockpit. And the texturing, the 8K texturing in particular that we looked at during the video is absolutely beautiful. Some of the best texturing work that I've seen in the sim, certainly when it comes to the weathering and the detailing throughout the cockpit. My only real gripe with the modelling, it would have been really nice as I say to have seen the rear cockpit section of the aircraft as well. Probably and very sadly, this is as close as you'll get to ever seeing a Vulcan ply the skies once again. These sorts of products are great for keeping historic, iconic aircraft alive. And so for me, the more detail, the more accuracy, the more realism that we can reproduce these brilliant aircraft in, the better. That really is the only fault that I can level at the visual modelling though. Really nice as well, once again, that we do have that custom 3D visual pilot model. As far as the aircraft's flight model goes, of course it is very hard for me to compare against anything else. All I can say there really is that the Vulcan certainly feels the part, and the flight model stacks up very nicely against both the P3D and X-Plane versions of the aircraft. Given the level of consistency there, I think it's fair to say at least that the Vulcan has been modelled in every bit as much depth as we've seen in X-Plane, and we know that X-Plane is a great sim when it comes to the flight modelling. I really like that the aircraft feels labouring, it feels heavy, the roll rate is slow. There's still that manoeuvrability to it though, as you'll have seen if you've ever been to an air show and seen the Vulcan. So once more, the flight model certainly feels the part, the aircraft is a real joy to fly. And as much as any other aircraft that I've flown in the sim, it doesn't feel like a default Microsoft Flight Simulator aircraft. Systems depth, again, I can keep things pretty brief there. Overall, the Vulcan is, quote-unquote, a study-level rendition of the aircraft. No failures, which I know is a little bit of a sticking point for some. Of course, it would be nice to see some failures modelled. But realistically, unlike your typical commercial jet, failures probably are going to feature a little bit less in a typical flight here with the Vulcan. Again, unfortunately the only area that's really lacking in systems depth is the rear section of the cockpit. We do have the AEO panel, but otherwise again, there is quite a bit missing down the back. As far as these sounds go, Just Flight had access to the real world Vulcan, and again I think that certainly shows. Pretty much every switch, every system, not only has an associated sound, but that sound is recorded from the real world aircraft. And externally, as far as the engine sounds go, I'm sure that many of you will agree that that iconic howl that I know so many of you were looking for has absolutely been nailed by Just Flight. There are just a couple of points that I would make regarding the sounds. Firstly, as far as the engine sounds go, externally, 
From the front of the aircraft, you only really get a whine. There's no rumble or roar from those Olympus engines. You do get that roar from the back, but overall the sheer power of the Vulcan isn't quite conveyed in the sound package. Similarly, whilst all of the switches and click sounds are recorded from the real-world jet and presumably are recreated at accurate levels, personally I would have liked to have had the switch and control sound just be that little bit louder. Firstly, it gives the actuation of the switch more presence, it allows you to enjoy the real-world sounds as well, and it just helps give you that little bit of feedback that you don't get from the real-world tactile operation of the switch. As far as the extras go, again the product is very strong. We have the onboard tablet with Simbrief and Navigraph integration. Multiple configuration options as well for the airframe, both in terms of the configuration and the loadout. And the sort of typical ground equipment that you would expect to see these days. We have covers, chocks, external GPU and air cart. The documentation as well, as is always the case with an in-house just flight product, is absolutely superb. All you need there to get you started with the Vulcan. I managed to get from zero to hero in about half a day's worth of flying, sitting down just with the manual and the checklist, all the info I needed was provided there. Lastly, in terms of the aircraft's FPS, we touched on that during the last video, I was losing about 20 FPS with the Vulcan, getting about 60 FPS with the aircraft versus around 80 with the default Cessna 152. All in all then, once again, I think Just Flight have done an absolutely excellent job with the Vulcan, it was an aircraft that I was really looking forward to in the sim, and the jet has gone above and beyond my expectations. I would go as far as to say that this is my own personal favourite aircraft in the sim currently. It's just such a unique, interesting piece of design, piece of history. It's significantly different to operate from probably most other aircraft that you've flown in most other sims. And overall, I just think that Just Flight have done a brilliant job of capturing the magic of the Vulcan. The product just keeps me wanting to come back for more. All of this as well for a very reasonable price, £28 for the product. Just Flight stating that they want to give a little something back to the community. Very commendable of course, and I certainly hope that that decision pays off for them in terms of sales. As long time viewers of the channel will probably recall, I typically do a top 10 list of add-on aircraft at the start of each year. And with 2024 rapidly approaching, I'll certainly be making the same list again. I can't really see any way that the Just Flight Vulcan will not be included on that list. Once again, a very big thank you to Just Flight for letting me both preview and review the aircraft. I do hope that all of you enjoyed the video, and if you did, please consider giving it a like. If you want to see more content from the channel then please do consider subscribing as well. And if you'd like to help support the channel further, you can do so by becoming a channel member or patron. I'll leave a link to both of those down in the video description below. As always, have a great day wherever you are, take really good care, and I will see you all again soon.